Now you're good. Right. Welcome to the EFIS episode 31. I'm Justin Ledger here with Zach Hummel, recovering after a solid 4th of July. Uh, so today's July 5th. We're troopers. We're just getting this thing done so we can get it out there. Zach, how was your weekend and how was your 4th of July? It was good, man. Uh, still recovering. Obviously, I had work today, which is insane. Like I told you before, yeah. I told no one to talk to me because I just don't yep. to anyone. Good thing is it's a short week, so uh, I'll probably take it easy for a little bit recovering. But yeah, uh, you know, we're giving it to the fans. We didn't have to do an episode this week given the holiday weekend, but baseball is still happening, so we have, we got to talk about it. Yeah, uh, fair warning to all the listeners right now. There's not going to be a ton of pizzazz, I don't think, in this episode. I think we're both sort of, uh, sort of just winging it right now, hoping. Well, maybe we'll have our moments, but overall, it's going to be. You're going to hear it in our voices, pretty much how the last few days have gone. Uh, so we'll start as always with our favorite stories of the past week. I guess it's been a little over a week, so we got plenty of topics for this episode. But we'll start with our favorite story since the last time we put out an episode. So Zach. I'll let you start. Yeah, so my story happened July 1st, um, or maybe the day before that. Uh, it was between the Dodgers and the Padres, a game. Uh, Dave Roberts, who's the manager of the Dodgers, and uh, I think his name's Andy Greens, the manager of the Padres. Yeah. Like, that's how ir- irrelevant the Padres are. Uh, right. They got in a little, like, little yelling match. The umps had to break it up. And it was over Alex Wood, who's been lights out for the Dodgers, was telling um, – I guess some guy on the Padres, some no name on second base was, I guess, quote unquote, p- tipping the pitch locations or the pitch to the guy hitting for the Padres and would pretty much threaten to hit the next guy who did that. No, I'm against pitchers like threatening to hit people because I think that's like when you have that ball in your hand, you have more power than anyone on the baseball field. So I right, kind of right. found it like a hard on move. I think would apologize like he saw red, but I think Roberts and Green just going at each other was so funny. That's the most. It's the most angry I've ever seen Dave Roberts. He seems like a pretty chill guy. Right. And he just got red hot uh, at Andy Green. It was a wild scene. Two managers kind of going at it. Yeah, I I have, I don't know if I've ever seen anything like that. To be honest, just managers, they actually shoved each other too, which is – and that caused the benches to clear and everything. I mean, we see players get into shoving matches. We see a lot of things. We see even managers going face-to-face kind of like they do with umpires where they're just spitting at each other. But we don't. We rarely see them actually make physical contact. So that was definitely interesting to watch. Definitely, uh, definitely an intriguing story for sure. Um, so I'll move on to mine. Uh, my favorite story for the past week or so was Miguel Montero. Um, don't know where this came from. Just decided to throw shade, kind of throw Ariad under the bus. Um, Jake Arietta, who I guess there was an instance where Miguel Montero. They, they were stealing all over Arietta and Montero. And Montero said that it's the pitcher's fault, not Montero's fault, that they're stealing bases on him. Um, usually, I kind of understand the catcher's point. Actually, no catchers really come out and like just blame their pitcher. But I, I get where a catcher is coming from when they blame the pitcher a little bit because it is sort of the pitcher's fault, too. You got to quicken your delivery to the plate. However... For a guy to just call out his teammate like that, for like in the media, for like everyone to see, it's not all, not just anyone too. It's a high profile guy like Jake Arrieta, um, kind of a bush league move. Needless to say, he was DFA'd a day later. Um, Cubs didn't want any part of that. Anthony Rizzo comes out and pretty much just throws a haymaker verbally at Montero, basically saying there's no place for that. Uh, he's not much of a leader, all that stuff. Uh, Cubs are a mess. We'll, we'll leave it at that. The Cubs are an absolute mess. We'll get to that in a little bit while. We're going to do a little panic meter segment, and I think both of our panic meters will be fairly high for them. But the Cubs are a mess. Uh, Montero was traded to the Blue Jays, which I found pretty interesting. Shows how much the Blue Jays have faith in Russell Martin for the future. So um, I don't know. That's my favorite story. I thought it was crazy how this all went down because Montero was sort of a hero in the playoffs for the uh, for the Cubs last year. Yeah, it's wild how, like, these things – they've obviously been festering for a while with a lot of the teammates, but, like, obviously we're not privy to what goes on in the Cubs, Cubs clubhouse, and it just comes out that kind of everyone hates him and he's an asshole. Like, no one had – everyone thought he was loving that clubhouse, but it's it's wild to see what happens behind closed doors with some of these teams that you just have no idea about. 
Yeah, and I don't know about what this says about Joe Madden, too, uh, his leadership in the clubhouse. Does he have control of that clubhouse? I think that's something that's going around a, a little uh, – on around that Joe Madden is starting to lose control of that clubhouse, which is interesting because that seems like one of the more fun places to play. I mean, you're on a team that just won a World Series uh, for the first time in like 100 years, and suddenly it seems like a toxic clubhouse. Like it doesn't seem to much, make much sense. Just goes to show you how much leadership a guy like David Ross has. And now that he's out of there, uh, you're seeing things kind of fall apart there. They're in second place now, so they're holding tight in that, NL, that crappy NL Central. But uh, it's, I mean, it's going to be a difficult rest of the year for them if they keep this up. Uh, we'll move on to another NL team that's sort of struggling right now. It's, it's our Rockies. You know, uh, the Colorado Rockies, they're 2-8 and eight in their last 10 games. Um, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what really there is to blame. I guess they just scuffled. heading. They're scuffling, I should say, heading into the end of this first half. Um, hopefully they can, you know, get some rest, pick it back up, heat back up in the second half. However, I think... If I had to pick one thing that's going to falter, if they falter, it's their rotation. Um, we've raved about that rotation as sort of what's made them the powerhouse that they are this season with their offense not being what we're used to seeing it. Like we, we expect the offense to be a powerhouse from beginning to end. Their rotation is picking up the, some of the slack from that offense, uh, but not really anymore. Like I said, 2-8 in their last 10, rotation full of a bunch of rookies. You kind of had a feeling this was going to happen at some point. Yeah, I mean, the only bright spot is John Gray's coming back, who's probably their best pitcher by far. I mean, Chad he pitched lights out. He pitched lights out, too, in his, his uh, debut back. Yeah, I mean, he's pitching tonight, so we'll see if he can follow that up with a good start. But I totally agree. The Rockies, I mean, they're just in a rough patch right now. Um, luckily, they have a, a pretty handle, uh, handily lead in the, in the wild card. But, yeah, I mean, their rotation, you got Chatwood, you got Kyle Freeland, who – you know, started well, but he got right. shelled again yesterday. Um, you got Sentazella. You got all these, like, no-name AAA major leaguer, you know, right-on-the-border guys who, I mean, they're not going to win consistently with those guys on the mound, especially as they move into their division and face the Dodgers and the D-backs who have better starting pitching, who have, you know, offenses that can take <laughs> advantage of your bad starting pitching. Right. It was a great story while it lasted, too. And I guess I bet I bet you any money that front office was looking at it like they hit a lottery ticket. And now they're realizing, fuck, we might have to make a move for a uh, ace at some point, because they, if you don't have that guy that you can count on every fifth day, I know I know Gray could be that guy eventually. But I mean, this is the year of the Rockies. you got to think that they're going to be go, trying to contend this year. They can still snag a wild card spot. They're falling apart in the NL West. But Wild card's definitely still up for grabs. So you got to think they're going to be buyers um, at this deadline and maybe part ways with a couple offensive pieces to just snag it, like some, someone who's even close to an ace because I don't think these rookies are going to hold up all year. Rookies have a hard time ever pitching more than 200 innings in a season. How do you think that's going to fare come playoff time? Um, it, it doesn't bode well for the Rockies. I, I would love to have a ton of faith in this team, but it's – it's hard to really function um, from the pitching side of things without that that veteran ace that you can just count on every fifth day. Um, so that's my take on the Rockies. Do you got anything else before we move on? No, I just think – I definitely think they'll make a deal at the bet deadline. Keep an eye on, like, this guy, Ramel Tapia, just came out of nowhere, and he's been good. So he might be trade bait. And I think they, they're ready. Carlos Gonzalez has kind of struggled. So if they can flip him for a good starting pitcher, right. they'll probably do that as well. Yeah, Cargo seems to be one of those guys who's on the block every year, but this could be the year that they're finally like, all right, we're going to pull the trigger because we're we're done with seeing him sort of struggle in the way he is. Like We have faith in him every year, and he constantly – so maybe this will be the year they par ways with Cargo or even another one of their, uh, their, their pieces in that offense. Uh, so we'll move on to another big piece of an offense. It's Trey Turner, who's out with a fractured wrist. He was hit by a pitch. Uh, sucks because this is one of the guys that I would I tune in to see play specifically because it's Trey Turner. Uh, he's awesome on all both sides of the ball, uh, shortstop and at, at the plate. Trey Turner is one of the best to watch, and this actually came right after he was just stealing bases like it was Little League. Uh, he stole I think four in a game, which is ties the franchise record uh, for the Nationals. And this guy is it's a sophomore season. So he's the real deal. 
And it, it's just unfortunate anytime a guy like this is sidelined. Yeah, he pretty much like started the Montero stuff by just stealing all over Arietta. So he kind of yeah. caused Montero getting DFA'd. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, he was. I mean, he's on my fantasy team, so I'm obviously wicked pissed because he's, he's yeah. just a maniac when it comes to those kind of numbers. But he was he's vital for that Nationals lineup to sort of start it out. Without him, they really don't have like a set leadoff hitter. It's kind of just a mishmash of guys. And it, like you said, he was stealing like two bases a game just easily too, which is, you know, that's how you win games late in the playoffs. You take those extra bases, you know, you bun a guy over, you hit a sack fly. Uh, hopefully he'll be back for the playoffs, but it, it – the craziest thing to me is like they don't they haven't really provided a timetable for him. Like obviously he broke his wrist, but there's no timetable for him to return. So I guess it's just how quickly he can recover. And you know, the Nationals probably hope, you know, quicker rather than later in that sense. Yeah, if we had Dr. Tom on, he could probably tell us the length that Turner might be out for. But a fractured wrist doesn't sound like one of those things that heals very quickly. Uh it also sounds like one of those things you probably want to be a little pre- uh precautionary about because Anytime you have a guy with a fractured wrist uh, swinging a bat, which involves basically like 60% wrist action, like that's what you do is like you swing a bat and you're using your wrist. So um, hopefully he comes back soon. I can't see that happening though. How do you think that affects the Nationals going forward? Do you think that, I mean, they're nine games ahead of the Braves. That's their next competition, that division. So I think they still win that division easily. But come playoff time, they have question marks. Now that Turner's gone and they have big time question marks in that bullpen. So how do you think they're going to fare? Yeah, I, I think their starting pitching is still like wicked elite. So I think they'll be fine. Um, yeah. You know, the guys that are replacing Turner are not terrible. Like Defoe has been pretty good for them. And they have Steven Drew, who obviously right. Red Sox fans remember him being terrible. But he's a good he's a good guy for just a stopgap. So yeah. I, I think the Nationals will see if Turner can actually come back and, and, and finish the season, uh, even if it's just for the playoff because he is so valuable. But I think they'll be fine just because they have so much depth. I agree. They're, they're still a powerhouse of a team, so I, I think they're still going to make it far into the postseason. They actually, I actually had them winning the World Series uh, at the beginning of the year, and I'm, I'm still sticking with that the way that they're looking right now. Uh, which is crazy too that the by the way the Braves like I said are their next competition they're only nine I know nine games back is like nothing to like scoff at but nine games back did you picture the Atlanta Braves only being nine games back of the Washington Nationals at the All Star break it's insane the Atlanta Braves who were supposed to be one of the if not the worst team this season yeah the Braves have been, the big, Braves have been wicked hot I mean their lineup is actually really good and their p- starting pitching has been a big surprise too so good for the Braves. Yep, absolutely. So next topic, John Farrell misses a game uh, to watch his son. Is I think it was his debut, right, uh, Luke Farrell? So, and I think both have had uh, issues with cancer. So it's a great story on both accounts. Um, so I it, was this like an, an issue? Did people criticize him for missing the game? Or yeah, I like, think like the Felgers and Mazes of the world like criticize. Yeah, of course Felger did. I mean that guy hates when like. That guy's like the hardo in like the worst sense of the word. He hates when people take like paternity leave. He hates all that shit. But um, yeah, so Farrell misses a game. I guess people get riled up about it. I I think it's a non-story. I mean, if it's your son starting in the major leagues his debut, you go and you say, "Hey, Gary D. Sarcina, can you please fill in for me for this one game? This one game in July, so I can watch my son pitch." Like. It's it's like a non-story. It's, I saw that it got added to the topic list, and I'm like, yeah, you should go see his son pitch. Like, yeah, I had no problem with it. Not even a question. I had no problem with it too. I think it's just like the the BBWAA like old writers still have this oh, thing that like stupid. managers, yeah, managers yeah. have to like they, they they value their team above their family, which is insane. I mean, my only question is like, if the Red Sox end up playing the Royals when Farrell's pitching like maybe he knows his son's weaknesses and he takes advantage of them I don't know if he's what I it would just be interesting because I don't know if like we've even seen that before like that's true yeah that's true I didn't even a, think of that a manager's son like pitching against his dad's team I don't know I feel like we've never seen that so it'd just be interesting to me like how that is handled because they both probably know what each other likes to do not that it really matters that much because it's baseball I mean there's you can only do so much but it would be interesting that is interesting. I guess the other way you can look at it, though, there already, I mean, there is scouting reports already. Like, there's gonna already gonna be plenty of scouting reports out on the guy by the time he pitches against the Red Sox if he does so. So anything that Farrell says would just kind of be icing on the cake uh, when it comes to that. 
Uh, but anyways, Luke Farrell, I think he got rocked in his debut. I'm not 100% sure. I think he had a bad start, though. And uh, But Sal Perez, who is obviously the Royals catcher, had nothing but good things to say about him. So I guess we'll see how his career goes uh, moving forward. Yeah, if he's any, if he pitches anything like his dad, he probably got rocked. Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Um, another guy who's been getting rocked, and he finally paid the price for it, Bartolo Colon, big sexy. Uh, he tried it out with the Braves. It didn't work out. His ERA was like 300,000. Uh, and so, yeah, the beloved Bartolo Colon DFA'd. Has he been signed by the Mets yet? Because I've been seeing a bunch of things saying the Mets might bring him back. Yeah, I heard the Mets are looking at him, the Orioles. So he's definitely got suitors out there. It's yeah. crazy how like a 40-plus guy with like a 3,000 ERA is being looked at just because like he once had a couple good seasons. It's just the aura around Bartolo Colon. Like, that's what it comes down to. If it was anyone else, if this was R.A. Dickey, everyone would be like, yeah, well, I probably don't want to sign that guy uh, unless we really need an arm come the postseason. Uh but yeah, Bartolo Colon. I mean, he's been. I haven't wanted to put him on a dud list this year, just because it's Bartolo Colon, and that guy can never really be a dud. But he's performance-wise been the biggest dud this season. Uh, hopefully, he falls on his feet, has a good, successful second half of the season with somewhere. Hopefully, with the Mets, that'd be a nice story. But yeah, Bartolo Colon DFA'd. Uh, it was about time the Braves made that move because it just was not working out for them. I could see, like, Bartolo Colon, like, never retiring officially and just, like, playing out his career. If someone wants to sign me at 50, like, I'll pitch. Like, I'll never 100% retire. I see that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could absolutely see, absolutely see that. Um, Bartolo Colon is just one of those guys. He's, he, he will play until he's, like, 55 and should not give a fuck. Uh, all right. So this is the big topic here. We got the home run derby coming up. We got the all-star game coming out. Uh, we're getting to the midpoint of the season. Uh, we got the all the, we have the All Star Game rosters. We have the full home run derby list of home run derby participants. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over the lists of the teams, or at least the starters on the All Star team, and then the home run derby. And we'll pick and choose who we think deserve to be on the team and who we don't think deserve to be on the team. So let's start with the All Star Game. Um, so at first base, we have Justin Smoke starting at first base. Well deserved. How, what do you think about that? Yeah, he's had a good season. Like another guy that, like, unless you follow baseball closely in the AL East, you probably have no idea about. But I think he hit. He, I think he hit another home run today. Like he's really been the only bright spot for that Blue Jays team. So yeah, well deserved to me. Yeah, I like when I like when guys like that get recognized. Yeah, I didn't think we were going to see that in the All-Star game this year. I didn't think we were going to see these no-name guys who are having spectacular seasons. I didn't think they were going to get recognition from fans. So this kind of puts faith in what I think of the fan voting. Um, but, yeah, Justin Smoke, well-deserved. Second base, obviously, we have Jose Altuve. I don't think we need to really go in-depth about that. That's expected. Uh, shortstop, we got Carlos Correa. Do you think he should be the starting shortstop, or do you think someone else should have filled in for him? I mean, in the final vote, you have Bogarts and Andrews, but I, I honestly think they're all kind of equal in my mind, so I don't really have a problem with one guy getting over the other. I just think Correa has, like, a little more pop than those guys, so that's probably why he gets it. Yeah, I agree with that, and the fact that Carlos Correa is on the winning, like, the best team in baseball right now, uh, he's that, the Astros are red hot. They are the most exciting team to watch by a long shot this season, so I think that makes that, – that gives Correa a lot of votes. Third base, Jose Ramirez, your guy. That's your guy right there. He that's great. That's great that he's at the hot corner for this All Star game. Yeah, I, I think it's well deserved with him too. I mean, I, I don't have any complaints there. Yep. Uh, catcher, we got Sal Perez, who's been in the All Star game since every year since 2013. Not a surprise. He's the best guy behind the plate, and he's got a bat too. So no surprise there. Uh, outfield. Aaron Judge, obviously. I mean, yeah, was there any was there any doubt there? Aaron Judge has been probably the best player overall in baseball this season. So there's that. We got Mookie Betts replacing Mike Trout. Um, Mike Trout obviously is injured, so Mookie Betts, perfect replacement. Uh, he kind of struggled by his standards to start the year, but he's been maybe the best player in the American League the past month. Uh, who else do we got here? We got George Springer. Again, Astros, self-explanatory. What do you got on Springer? Yeah, Springer definitely deserves it. Um, I just 
I don't care how these guys get voted in who like won't aren't even playing, like have no chance of playing. Like Trout has no chance of playing. It's like they should take him yeah. off the ballot and just let someone yeah. vote in. I, just, I don't get that either. I don't get how that all works. Why are they on the ballot? Just take them off. They physically can't. They aren't playing. Uh, <laughs> Wait, I, I think it like just does it for their contract. Like if you get voted to X amount of All Star games, True. bonus. So maybe that's it. But that actually, that makes sense. That's probably the reason. Uh, DH, we got Corey Dickerson from the Tampa Bay Rays. That's unexpected, mostly because it's Tampa, and I don't think Corey Dickerson's one of those guys who's really a household name by any means. So those two factors combined has me shocked that Corey Dickerson's the DH. But he is the best DH probably in the American League, or one of them. Like he's awesome to watch. Yeah, to me, he's like not even a DH. Like he plays a good outfield. Like to me, I don't know. That was that was one guy I was like, eh. I looked at his numbers and I'm like, yeah, he probably deserves it. But a guy like Nelson Cruz to me is like a DH, and he's having a good year. So I didn't really have a problem with Dickerson getting in. But I, if Nelson Cruz got in, I wouldn't have been like that. That like shocked. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so pitchers, I'll just list them off quickly. And if you have any guys who sort of, uh, jump out to you, just I have let one me know. For sure. Okay. I'll, I'll just list them off. You, you let me know about that guy. We got Chris sale, obviously Dallas Keuchel again, obviously Irvin Santana, Jason Vargas, Luis Severino, you Darvish, Michael Fulmer, Corey Kluber, Lance McCullers, Craig Kimbrell, Andrew Miller, Dallin Batantis. Yeah. Fox. The guy the guy I had a problem with is, like, Luis Severino. I think, he like, he had a good couple starts, but he's been, like, downright terrible his last, like, four or five starts. Okay. Obviously, he's a young, exciting player, but I just don't think he's good enough to be in the game. I think they need to meet their quota of Yankees in the game, so they threw Severino in there. I yeah, just – I think everyone else is, like – McCullers, too. Like, he's been kind of struggling as well, but, again, he's on the best team in baseball. But those are the only two guys I had really problems with. I mean, Irvin Santana's having a career year. Jason Vargas is, like, lowest ERA, yeah. most wins, like, unreal season, so he deserves to be in. Uh, Vargas so- is probably going to be traded, too, at the deadline, so I guess enjoy his time in a Royals uniform on the All-Star game, in the All-Star game while it lasts. It's crazy how a guy like that just has, like, a one-off season. He's, like, he's top two or three Cy Young for the AL right now, which is it's crazy. It's crazy. Baseball is fucking stupid. Uh, <laughs> AL reserves, I'll just list these off, same deal. Gary Sanchez. Yonder Alonso, Starlin Castro, Jonathan Scope, Miguel Sano, Francisco Lindor, uh, Mookie Betts, but we are, we just said he's starting, Abisal Garcia, Michael Brantley, Nelson Cruz. Yeah, I didn't really have a problem with any of these guys, to be honest. Yeah. I think it's pretty much the cream of the crop. Starlin Castro, I mean, he's injured, so I don't know what they're going to do there. Yeah. Um, Abisal Garcia, like, I would almost look at him to start. He's had an unreal year, like, with his average. He's, like, been – one of the only good hitters within the White Sox lineup. So if he started, I wouldn't have been shocked, but I think he's like really having one of the best like poster board seasons among those reserves, but I didn't really have a problem. Yonder Alonso too is like kind of shocking. Yeah. I love seeing those type of guys on this list because uh, again, I, I like the under the radar players. They're guys that we talk about, but the public doesn't really talk about, at least we don't hear them talk about that much. Uh, so I like seeing them get some recognition I'll try to cruise through the NL so we can move on to the home run derby, but just stop me if you got any input on these guys. First base, we got Ryan Zimmerman. Uh, I think we expected this because he was the best player in baseball for like the first two months of the season. Kind of cooled off a little bit, but he's still, I think, deserving of the starting nod. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Second base, we got Daniel Murphy, uh, another Washington national who's, I mean – this isn't surprising either. He's probably – you can make an argument for a couple other guys, but probably the best second baseman in the National League. Uh, now, here's an in- interesting one. Shortstop, Zach Kozar, uh, another under-the-radar guy, but we've raved about him before. He was a when-you're-hot-you're-hot guy for us uh, a few weeks ago. So, Zach Kozar, shortstop. I didn't really have a problem with it. Again, like, he's having a his career year, so I think he deserves to be in, in like – Pretty much all the best shortstops are in the AL. So the NL, it's like pretty much slim pickings. It's like Cozart, Corey Seager, like maybe Trevor Story, but he's having a terrible yeah. year. So, Yep. So now we got third base, Nolan Arenado, my favorite player, well-deserved. Got nothing. Chris Bryant's having a down season, so Nolan Arenado is going to jump and take advantage of that. Uh, we got at catcher Buster Posey. The least surprising thing ever is he's the starting catcher again for the National League. Um, 
outfield, Bryce Harper. I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong. Um, he has not cooled off. He's still just as good as he was in April. Um, so, yeah, Bryce Harper, outfield. Charlie Blackman, he got recognition. We got a couple Rockies in here. I love it. I love it. The Rockies are getting some pub. Charlie Blackman in the MVP race. He's in the outfield. And Marcel Ozuna rounds out your your starting outfield for the National League. Any thoughts on that? Uh, they're all really well deserved. I would have liked to see Bellinger over Harper. I that's just me. Yeah. Obviously, Bryce Harper has a star power, but I think Bellinger like people will pay to see him since it's his first All Star game. Uh, Stanton could have obviously been in there too, but I think Ozuna's had a better season. So I'm glad that the name recognition didn't matter. Like Ozuna's not a well recognized name compared to Stan, but he has a better season. So he is a exactly. star. I absolutely love that. I could not agree more. That's like the one thing that has always bothered me is when like Derek Jeter would start at shortstop and he'd be bad. He'd be, he'd have like five homers and like a 260 batting average. That would bug the shit out of me. Uh, all right. So again, I'll name the pitchers and the reserves. If you got anyone that stands out. Let me know. Clayton Kershaw, Max Scherzer, Robbie Ray, Zach Greinke, Carlos Martinez, Steven Strasburg, Kenley Jansen, Greg Holland, Wade Davis, Brad Hand, Corey Neville, Pat Nashuk. Uh, again, no real issues. Some guys I don't think are having great years that made it. Like Carlos Martinez, he's having an okay year. I don't, I don't know. Like. Maybe with Gio Gonzalez from the Nationals, but they already have like so many other pitchers. They have Strasburg and Scherzer, right. so yeah. maybe they did one of those things. Nishek, like I don't watch the Phillies, so I have no idea if he's having a good season. I guess he <laughs> he's is. having he's actually a career year. He's like he's on the Phillies, which means he's not going to get any publicity because he's it's the Phillies. But um, he's actually having a career year. He's an older guy too, and he's fine. He's having one of the best seasons ever of his career. All right, good for Pat yeah. Nishek. I mean. Good for him. Brad Hand. Brad Hand is like one of my underrated guys. I love yeah. to watch pitch. Like he just has a nasty breaking ball. I don't really have a problem with any of these guys. Maybe the Braves bullpen's been lights out. So maybe I would have liked seeing a guy from there. I mean, they have no pitching here and they've been like a pretty good pitching team. So I don't know. Right. Brad Hand. Hand is an awesome last name to have as a pitcher. I just want to say that real quick. Yeah. Uh, reserves for the National League. Yadier Molina, Paul Goldschmidt, Joey Votto. DJ LeMay, Hugh, Josh Harrison, Jake Lamb, Corey Seager, Cody Bellinger, Giancarlo Stanton, Michael Conforto, Ender Inciarte. So the third base position in the NL is like the shortstop in the AL. It's like absolutely stacked. So Jake Lamb made it here. Bryant, I know, is in the final vote final candidates. Vote. And Rendon, too, who's in the final vote. I, I'm looking for Travis Shaw. Like, I think he's having right. – I was really just bad. about to say that. I'm glad you said that so I didn't have to. I don't know where he is, the mayor of Ding Dong City. Like, yeah. he should at least be in the final vote. And the Brewers are playing well, so it's not like he's on a terrible team. I would like to see Travis Shaw someplace. Yeah, I don't understand that at all. I That was, like I said, I was going to point that out if you didn't. So, Travis Shaw is missing from this. That's what I took out of those reserves is that Travis Shaw is not there. So, that kind of bothers me. Everything else, I actually don't have a problem with these rosters at all. I think most of the, that 99% of these guys, it's well-deserved. So, props to the fans for getting it right. For sure. We don't have – baseball has a lot of young stars right now, and it's no it, – it doesn't really have a lot of those old guys that are just getting in the game because of recognition. Like, you don't see Pujols in this game because he doesn't fucking deserve it. He's a big name. Exactly. But, like, guys that deserve it are getting it, which makes – I love that. Makes it way more enjoyable. It's going to be a much better event to watch than it would be if, if again, if, like, these old veterans, these big-name veterans were playing that aren't even that good anymore. Who do you uh, have for your last – who do you have for your last vote? Who would you vote for in the ALNL for last vote? For a final I can, vote? I can, yeah, final vote. Okay, so I'll list off the American League here, and we'll both take our pick. Elvis Andrews, Xander Bogarts, Didi Gregorius, Logan Morrison, Mike Moustakis. I'm taking Mike Moustakis. I don't know about you, but that's my guy. Yeah, I took Moustakis, too. I think he's he's had a bounce-back year, and he's just like pretty much carry, carrying the Royals right now, so I'd go Moustakis there. Yep. Yeah, I think a lot of people would expect us to take Bogarts, be a little biased, but he, I mean, the power hasn't been there. Um, no. That guy will hit like 330, 340, but the power has been non-existent, and that's disappointing for us because we've always looked at Bogarts as a guy who's supposed to have a, a good amount of pop. Uh, but Moustakis kind of has it all this season. He's a guy, he was, he was one of your duds at the very, very beginning of the year, 
but he has proven both of us wrong. Uh, he's been fantastic for the Royals, and maybe, who knows? Maybe he'll be wearing a Red Sox uniform in the second half. We'll see. Um, so we'll see the National League now. Justin Bohr, I think that's going to be your guy, but we'll see. Uh, it is your guy, Justin Bohr? No, it's not my guy. But oh, okay. Justin Bohr, Chris Bryant, Anthony Rendon, Mark Reynolds, Justin Turner. Yeah, so this list is really hard because all these guys are having unreal years. Yeah. Like in the AL, it's like, all right, Bogarts is having a decent year. Andrews is okay. Like D.D. Gregorius, like, I mean, he's not having an unreal year. All yeah. these guys are having career years, which is like – it's a pain that only one of these guys makes the it. The National out. League seems to be stacked every year, and it seems like they lose to the American League every year. The National League has so much more talent, but for some, for whatever reason, they always lose to the American League. Makes no I sense. Think that, I think the AL might have the pitching, like, this year at least. True. Like, advantage, like, other than Kershaw, I mean, there's not a starter yeah. there that I'm, like, scared to face, really. It's I mean, him, Scherzer, and then everyone else is so low on the totem pole. Yeah, exactly. Like Robbie Ray, he gives, yeah. he gives up like bombs. But right. I, I'd go Justin Turner. Uh, I think yeah. he deserves it. He's been like a, a a great veteran. He's he's hitting like 340. I mean, he's he's. I think he's guy. hitting 380. I'm pretty sure he's hitting 380 right now. I mean, he, <laughs> Sorry. he should be the guy. I mean, yeah, the guy. Yeah, that's insane. Anyone who's batting 380 is isn't in the All Star game shows the system's a little. A little bit flawed still, to say the least. He has one of the best swings in baseball, too. I know we talked about that last week, but he just has, like, a softball swing where he just, like, lifts his leg and just lets it fly, which I love. Yeah, I, I love it. Uh, it sucks. I don't get how he's not voting. I hope he gets the final vote, but my gut tells me, like, Chris Bryant will get it because of the name. Um, exactly. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe maybe they'll get it right again, the fans. Uh, all right, so we'll move on to the home run derby now. Um this is easier to point out, like, snubs and, like, who deserves it, who doesn't. Um, so here's the AL side. we got Aaron Judge. If Aaron Judge wasn't going to be in the Derby, that would have been the most disappointing thing of all time. Uh, Aaron Judge is my pick to win it. How about you? I got to go Justin Bohr. I mean, he's my, okay. he's my guy, all so right. I'm going to pick him to win. I just think he has, like, the easiest power there. So I'm going to go with him. Okay, so I'm going Judge. You're going Bohr. Um, I'll continue to list off the American League, then I'll mention Bohr and the National Leaguers. So we got Aaron Judge, we got Gary Sanchez. First off, I agree 100% with Logan Morrison, who was snubbed for this. Uh, Gary Sanchez has 13 home runs this year. I think Logan Morrison has 24, uh, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yep. And Logan Morrison pretty much said, oh, I remember, like he was pissed that he was left out of the Derby and Sanchez got the nod over him. And Morrison said, I remember when I had 13 home runs a month and a half ago. So I agree with them. I normally I'd be like, that's kind of petty to come out and say something like that, but I couldn't agree more with that statement. They just got Sanchez so they can have another Yankee alongside, alongside judge, which is kind of stupid. Um, but all right. So it's judge Sanchez, Mike Moustakis and uh, Miguel Sano. Do you have a problem with any of those guys other than Sanchez? Uh, no, I, I just I think they picked Sanchez because the the home run derby's in Miami and he's Cuban, so there's like a big okay, that's a good point. There. But that's a good point. I didn't even think I'm of not, that. I'm not really like <laughs> Logan Morrison. Like I know he's having a great year, but like saying you got snubbed for the home run derby, it's like, are you that pissed about it? I mean, yeah. it's just another thing you have to do. I I maybe because he doesn't ma didn't make the game, like he he's pissed. Like he's like yeah. at least he's on the home run derby, so maybe maybe that's it. But yeah. I mean, Sanchez, there's probably reasons behind that that we're not privy to, but yeah. I agree with the Miami take. That seems to make a lot of sense now that you mentioned that because I didn't, I didn't even think of that. Uh, National League now, we got Cody Bellinger. Again, that's a no-brainer the way he's been playing. Charlie Blackman, another one of our guys. Your guy, Justin Bohr. Uh, who else do we got here? There's one more, right? Stanton. Oh, yeah, Giancarlo Stanton. So, again, Miami – um, he's the Miami guy and he's the defending champ, if I'm not mistaken. So he's going to be in it. Uh, so yeah, you got Boar. I got judge. I think the, when's the Derby, the 10th, July 10th. Yep. So next that, Monday. Next I actually, what, what's that? I actually had a snub. Like I think Eric Thames should be in it just because. Yeah. I don't know how he wasn't in it. I would have even put him instead of, um, what's his name? I'd probably put him even over Blackman for the home run Derby. I, sure. yeah. I love Blackman, but I'd probably put him over Blackman there in the NL. See, they're going for guys that hit a lot of home runs, but, I mean, 
the only things we want to see in the Horman Derby is guy hit like tape measure shots. Like that's right. I want to see just like balls like mashed like almost four hundred feet and like Blackman has power. Like he hits a lot of home runs, but they're not like bombs. Like yeah, we want to see these like almost superhuman figures. Like we used to see like Maguire, Sosa, like guys like that. Yeah. I mean, those guys don't really exist anymore, except like Judge. But I, like, that's like a very, that's like the exception. We don't really see like these monstrous guys anymore. I, I guess Bohr, Judge, and Stanton, Stanton are those guys for this derby. But Blackman's far from that. I mean, that don't let that beard fool you. He's a smaller guy than the other guys. So, um, yeah, that's the home run derby lineup. I really don't have any problem with it, but I do agree with Thames. I think Thames should be in it. He's cooled down, but I still think Thames the way the way how much hype was surrounding him. Um, now he's not in the All Star game or this right. He's on the All Star game either. So. Um, a little bit surprising, but that's the way it is. Uh, so that's the all-star game and the Derby. We'll definitely cover that because the Derby is on, is this coming Monday. Uh, and we record Monday night. So if we, if we record Monday night, then we'll preview the Derby and, uh, all that good stuff. Maybe even record a tiny little thing recapping it. Um, so now we got panic meter. It's back. The panic meter is back. It's almost the all-star break. Um, so we said we were going to wait a little while before we do panic meter again. It's time. We, things are starting to take shape. Uh, we're panicking about some new teams, teams that we, we didn't think necessarily we'd have to panic about uh, a few weeks ago. So let's we'll start with the Baltimore Orioles. or yeah, not the Orioles, the Orioles. They're 40 and 43. They're eight and a half games back in the East. Um, what's your meter at for the Orioles? Uh, my meter is at an eight. Like, I okay. think this is DEFCON most. Uh, have the pitching to, like, go on these huge winning streaks because they just don't have that, like, shutdown guy who can win you a game no matter what. I mean, Chris Tillman, Dylan Bundy, like, these are their best pitchers, and they're not even, you know, the third starter on a good team, a World Series team. So I'd go eight on the panic meter for the Orioles because this division is, is wicked tough right now. It's not going to get easier for them by any means. I'm going 9.3. I think they're done. I think they're a last place team in this division. The Blue Jays are going to take over uh, for that fourth place spot. Even the Rays are playing a lot better than the Orioles right now. So um, I don't think the Orioles are going anywhere. I think all that that lack of true talent in that starting rotation is starting to catch up to them. Um, and their power numbers have been down compared to years past. So, uh, yeah, I think they're a last place team. And it's hard to really have – hard to not panic when your team's in last place. So – I'm giving them a 9.3 in the panic meter. Uh, so I just mentioned the Blue Jays. What's your panic meter after the Blue Jays? They're in last place, 38 and 45, 10 and a half games back. Yeah, like I'm hearing now they're going to be sellers. Like their teams are looking at Stroman and, and other guys like that. Panic meter, I mean, maybe a couple weeks ago, it was at like an eight. I'd go 10 right now. I mean, they're yeah. in back of the Orioles, who I gave an eight. So if they're already thinking about selling their pieces, I'd go 10 for the panic meter because they were. I mean, they, they were the class of the AL East the last couple of years, and now they're just yep. the the bottom. So, yeah, they're a very below average team right now. Although I'm gonna go similarly similar to the Orioles, I have them like I said finishing ahead of the Orioles at the end of the season. So I'll go like nine point, uh, straight up nine. I'll give them. Um, so I think if I had to guess who the headliner would be at this trade deadline, I think it could be Josh Donaldson. Um, I could definitely see the Blue Jays moving Donaldson for some pieces if they if they really are going to sell at this deadline. Uh, there's going to be a lot of need for third baseman now. I don't know who really would be buying. I know the Red Sox are me in the in the market for a third baseman. Um, I don't think they're going to part way part ways with like a lot of guys to get Donaldson, but there are teams probably who will. So uh, yeah, the the Blue Jays probably gonna, are they're going to be sellers. So it's hard not to put them on the panic meter as well. Um, how about the Seattle Mariners? Yeah. 40, I mean, 41, 44, 16 and a half games back. So they're done in the AL West. Yeah. They're pretty much just living for the wild card right now. Um, like I know we're, we were both pretty high in the Mariners coming into this year, given yeah. their lineup and everything. They've had injuries. They're three games out of the, the second wild card, which in the AL is like a dog fight right now. There's like yeah. eight or nine teams within like a couple games. Um, Panic meter for the Seattle. They, I mean, they're three and seven in their last ten. I would go eight point seven. I, I, these teams, like, we're we're at the All Star break, pretty much. I mean, the panic meter has to be high. You have to decide yeah. whether you're a buyer or a seller right now. Right. 
Yeah, I don't know what the Mariners are going to do. They're kind of a wild card, so to speak, um, <laughs> as a team. Uh, but, yeah, I have no idea what to expect from them because they have so much talent on that roster, but it's really just not living up to expectations. I'm going to go an 8.2. Um, we know for a fact they aren't winning the division, so that's not really even the question. It's the wild card, which is still in reach. So I don't necessarily think they're a wild card team, but it's not out of reach yet, so I wouldn't necessarily panic. Um, so now we have the Chicago Cubs. Who would have thought at the All-Star break, like last season that at the All-Star break this year, we'd have the Cubs as a panic meter candidate? Yeah. Um, God, the Cubs. It, it's insane how like quickly things can change for teams. I mean, I there's, to be totally honest, their pitching is just bad. Like their starting pitching yep. is just terrible. So – um, and there might be some divisions in the clubhouse. I mean, Montero obviously was the scapegoat, but there could be other things. Rumblings happen. They've been terrible on the road this year. They're still within reach of the Brewers, who I do not trust, though. So I don't – I'm not going to give them that high of a panic meter. I'll probably go 5.6, teetering really? on okay. a little bit higher, just because they just have to focus on beating the Brewers, which I think the Mariners – Mariners have no chance at the division. They just have to focus on the wild card, but the Cubs can just focus on the Milwaukee series. If they can get games on Milwaukee, they can win that division, and then all bets are off once you get to the playoffs. So I'm going to go 5.6 on the Cubs. Um, right. Yeah. I'm going to go 7.5. I think anytime you have the defending champs and now you're sub-500 uh, and the Milwaukee Brewers are beating you in the division, you got to have that panic meter all like almost all the way up. Uh, the Cubs – we're seeing that there's a lot of flaws in this team that we didn't really notice last season. Uh, clearly, they were having that magical season last year, and suddenly now that they have some problems, uh, everything's kind of out there for us to see it, and they don't look that great. Uh, Chris Bryant's not even going to be an all-star probably this season, so uh, it does, just doesn't seem like things are going right for the Cubs this year. i got to put that panic meter at a solid 7.5. I don't even – I mean, I'm not going to bet money on it by any means. I don't think they're going to be a playoff team. Um, cause if they lose in that NL central, I think a team like the Rockies is going to top them in the wild card. So, um, I am panicking if I'm a Cubs fan. Um, so now we'll move on to the St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah, obviously they didn't have the expectations the Cubs did preseason just because the Cubs are coming off world series. But I think St. Louis, I don't know if they're overachieving or underachieving. Their team yeah. is just kind of blah. Like they just have a lot of like farm system guys that no one really knows. And they're, they're playing okay for giving their roster. They're only four and a half games out. They're one game behind the Cubs, so I give a 5.6. So I'm going to give the Cardinals a 4.4 on their panic meter just because my expectations weren't that high. So I'm not sure they're panicking right now, but the, I do think they're sellers at the deadline if they go on a little, little bit of a big losing streak here. I didn't expect the Cardinals to really do anything this season. So the fact that they're only four and a half games out, I guess, is kind of optimistic Like from my standpoint like meeting my expectations. So now if we're going by my expectations and all that, then the panic meter for me is like a 5.2. I mean, I don't think they're going to be a playoff team, but I don't know if many people really expected them to like work their way into the playoffs, especially in the NL central. Um, so yeah, 5.2. I'm not really totally panicking if I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan, because you're kind of still in it. You're probably not going to make it. You, you didn't really, you shouldn't have expected to make it in the first place. Um, so now we got, lastly, the Colorado Rockies. Sucks that we're putting them on here, but we got to put them on here. Uh, what's your panic meter at for the Rockies, who are seven? Now they found themselves seven and a half games back suddenly in that division. Dodgers got red hot. The Rockies are two and eight in their last 10. So it hasn't been a good stretch for the Rockies. I know. It's, it's sad to say, but the good thing is the NL wildcard scene, it kind of sucks. So, like, they do have some cushion there. Right. panic meter in terms of the Dodgers have been really good I mean it's not like the Rockies have been playing terrible but the Dodgers have also been unreal so yeah. it's kind of been just a bad mix there I think the Dodgers will cool off and the Rockies will heat back up not that they're going to go win the NL West but they'll probably be a stable wild card team the whole year so panic meter for the Rockies I'm going to go 5.1 like literally okay. middle of the road but uh, this next week will probably tell a lot before the all-star break to be totally honest Yep, I definitely think so. I'm going to go 6.3. Um, with all the hype that was surrounding the Rockies, I think they're finally coming back to earth. Um, I don't want to say that they're regressing to the mean or anything like that, but I don't think they're as good of a team that they made themselves out to be for like the first two or three months. I think we're starting to see that there are flaws, like I said before, in that rotation. Um, 
Greg Holland and Adam Adovino and like guys in that bullpen, they're fantastic, but they're not going to be like Craig Kimbrell and Kenley Jansen all season long. So I think sooner or later, we're going to have to see really what the Rockies are made of. So I'm going to put like 6.2, 6.3 um, for the Rockies in the panic meter. Uh, so we'll move on from that to our usual segments. Um, we got duds this week, and we got when you're hot, you're hot. So we'll start with duds. Who's your dud of the week? Yeah, my dud of the week. Um, funny we talk about Pat Neshek on the Phillies. Like, I don't watch them. But this guy, I looked at his stats today, like, just randomly. I mean, Michael Franco has been absolutely terrible for the Phillies. Like, maybe one of the worst players in baseball. And this guy was going to be their four-hitter, like, middle of the middle of the order classic you know face of the franchise guy young guy with Aldubo Herrera and he's just been terrible uh he's in 218 yeah. it's not that like I, I always thought of him as like a guy that struck out a lot because he swings at a terrible amount like terrible pitches across the board but he's he's almost 200th in the MLB in in, in strikeout so That's it's insane. not that he's striking out I think he's swinging at like terrible pitches like he almost has a Vlad Guerrero syndrome where he just like almost swings at everything and then he just doesn't have like a high average. I know Guerrero did like part of his career, but Michael Franco, I just I just don't know what happened to this guy. I thought he was on pace to be, you know, one of the best young players in baseball. And he's just had a some kind of a sophomore slump, if you can even say that. Yeah, I actually think he's gonna be I heard a lot of things that he was gonna be on the trading block for the Phillies this year. Um, don't know if they've kind of taken that bat because I think he's done he's done a little bit better in like the past week or so. Um, but I don't know if the Phillies are still going to look to, I mean, again, there is a market th at the third base position. So, um, I mean, we could be looking at maybe even, you know, the Red Sox, the Giants, or like some teams like that to be looking at third baseman like Franco. I want, if I, as a Red Sox fan, I want no part of Franco though. That's, that's for damn sure. I don't know what you think about that, but st I, in my opinion, stay far away from Franco. Yeah, I mean, he is, he's only 24. So, I mean, if you don't have to give up a lot, I'd be in for him. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. If you don't have to give up much, then, I mean, like, he's definitely an asset. But um, if you have to give up a lot, I would not want to part ways with pieces for him. Mine is Billy Hamilton. Um, Billy Hamilton, he'll steal you some bases when he gets on base, but he's not going to get on base very often. Uh, he He's always been in my mind as one of the most overrated players in the game just because he's so fast. But as we see more guys like, say, Malik Smith, guys who can actually make contact – and get on base. Um, I mean, as we see more guys like that come into the league, guys like Billy Hamilton are going to be like, whatever, like, fuck it. Like, who cares? Because Billy Hamilton is really not that good of a baseball player. He's just good at stealing bases. That's pretty much it. So that's my little bit Billy Hamilton rant. I'm just tired of – like, he's one – he's like a big-name guy, and it's only because he's that quick. So um, Billy Hamilton's my dud of the week. Yeah, he's like a he's like a punt returner that's like really fast and like scores a couple touchdowns, but like he can't catch, so he can't do anything. Right. Else. So that's actually a really good comparison. I, I don't even know how you just like thought of that on the spot, but I, I mean that was that was pretty spot on. Uh, <laughs> I'm just firing on all cylinders right now. <laughs> all right, so we'll leave off with our last segment. When you're hot, you're hot. Um, so I'll start with this one. Mine is Andrew McCutcheon. Uh, he fell oh. off the face. Fell off the face of the earth last season, subject to trade talks all winter. Um, again, he struggled out of the gates, and uh, he's probably been the best player in the National League for the past month. He's batting – he batted 400 uh, in June, which is – I mean, I, that's pretty pretty damn good. So McCutcheon getting his name back on the map. Who knows? Now that he, his value is increasing, maybe he'll be traded at this deadline. Who, who, know, who really knows with McCutcheon and the way the Pirates treat him? Yeah, it's going to be weird not to see McCutcheon in the All-Star game for the Pirates. He's been sort of like a stalwart there for them. Yeah, um, He started the season pretty bad, so it's good that he's he's really picking things up. Uh, my, yeah. my guy who's hot right now is a guy that has maybe the best hair in the MLB. He plays for the best team in the MLB, Yuli Gurriel. Oh, not yeah. many people know about him. He's a Cuban guy. He plays – he plays third for the Astros. I don't know if it's possible to be a guy in the Astros. No one knows, but no one really knows about this guy. He's He hit 600 this past week, led the MLB in RBIs over the week. He had two home runs. This guy has is, is really been in the been in the shadows of Springer, Altuve, Correa, but he's he's been picking up. Him and Marwin Gonzalez, I think, are two of the most like probably underrated players on the Astros. So 
Yuli Gurriel is mine. When you're hot, you're hot. He's been really good lately. As if the Astros need any more help. I mean, it's I know, insane right? that, what that offense has. They hit so many bombs. They, I think they have like the least amount of strikeouts. Uh, so that things are going pretty well for that offense, and the pitching hasn't been a disappointment really either. Um, so that pretty much wraps everything up, uh, unless you got anything else, Zach. No, I think we're good. All right, so as usual, subscribe on iTunes, leave a review, all that good stuff. Uh, unsubscribe, subscribe again, unsubscribe, subscribe again, do all that stuff. Help us out a little bit. Uh, what the beak. Um, follow us on Twitter at Ephus, Ephus Pod. Like us on Facebook. Uh, that's pretty much it. We'll be back to recording hopefully this coming Monday. And uh, as we said before, the Home Run Derby is Monday. So we'll do our best to either preview, recap that. We'll see how the scheduling goes. But we're going to do our best to kind of cover that for you guys come the next episode. So on that note, we will see you guys later. Peace.